If you ever put the SU-57 Felon and the F-35 Lightning II side by side, something becomes obvious almost immediately. They look like they belong to the same generation. Stealth geometry, internal weapon bays, faceted edges, but beneath the skin, they're not even playing the same game. The Su-57 is a heavyweight sprinter built for violent maneuver and raw aerodynamic freedom. The F-35? It's the quiet assassin, smaller, denser, calmer, and armored with something the Sukhoi does not have, information superiority. The world likes to treat these two fighters as rivals sitting across the same table, as if one is simply Russia's answer to America's stealth empire. But that comparison falls apart once we ask a harder question. What was each jet actually built to do? Because purpose is everything. Purpose shapes wings. Purpose shapes engines. Purpose shapes stealth, sensors, doctrine and war. Let's start with size. The Su-57 is big, about 20 meters long with a 14 meter wingspan that carries the presence of a flanker but wrapped in 21st century shaping. It breathes with two afterburning turbofans that push it toward Mach 2 Plus, giving Russian test pilots room to play with energy, altitude and angles the way flanker family pilots always loved to. Nose high, aggressive, super maneuverable. The felon doesn't just turn, it contorts. It bends aerodynamics into submission using 3D thrust vectoring, massive control surfaces, and a lifting body big enough to swallow fuel, weapons, and radar arrays most jets would struggle to carry. Then you switch to the F-35, and the philosophy flips. It's smaller, 15.7 meters nose to tail, wings only 10.7 meters across, and just one engine. But not just any engine. The Pratt & Whitney F-135, the most powerful fighter engine ever put into serial production. The F-35 doesn't need muscle the way the Su-57 does. It needs heat managed, radar suppressed, and signatures erased. It needs sensors closer together for fusion. It needs volume for avionics instead of range. It needs discipline, not brute force. And so it carries itself like a coiled spring. Never flashy, never flamboyant, but always dangerous, especially before you even know it's there. This is where their paths split. Russia builds fighters like warriors, fast, muscular, aggressive. The United States builds fighters like networks, invisible, data-driven, unflustered. One fights like a boxer, the other fights like a sniper. And stealth is where the sniper makes his living. The F-35 is what happens when you design an aircraft around invisibility first and flight characteristics second. Divertless intakes, S-shaped ducts that hide turbine blades like state secrets, ram coatings layered over knife-angled airframe facets, all tuned to shrink that radar signature to somewhere between a marble and a golf ball from the front. A jet that can get within weapons range without even showing up on your radar screen isn't a fighter, it's a ghost with missiles. The Su-57 has stealth too, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Internal bays, serrated doors, RAM, infrared signature work, RCS shaping. It's not a brute, but it compromises more intentionally. It chooses agility and range over absolute stealth purity. The engine faces are more exposed. The panel seams don't vanish like F-35 skin. Side profiles and rear aspects bloom on radar more easily. Analysts consistently place the felon closer to 4.5 Gen Stealth Plus, not on the same low observable tier as the F-22 or F-35. And here's the wild part. This wasn't a mistake. It was a decision. 
Because Russia doesn't expect to own the sky, it expects to contest the sky. If the F-35 is built for surprise kills beyond visual range, the Su-57 is built to survive getting seen, to dogfight, to accelerate, to bend physics when it has to. But stealth is only half the war now. The other half is data. The F-35 is less an aircraft than a flying server, a node in a battlefield cloud. Its radar, EOTS, DAS, EW suite, data links. Everything feeds into one fused picture of the fight, not just for itself, but for everyone around it. Ships, SAM batteries, AWACS, other F-35s, even fourth-gen fighters riding formation like wolves behind a silent lion. It sees, shares, classifies, and kills before the enemy even knows the fight has begun. In a battle where milliseconds decide survival, knowing more is deadlier than turning harder. The Su-57 brings its own sensors to the table. The N036 Bielka AESA, an IRST system sharp enough to see heat blooms beyond BVR, and rumoured L-band arrays in the wings that can help sniff out stealth aircraft. In theory, the Felon can spot low observable adversaries better than older radars ever could. In practice, those systems haven't yet been battle-proven against 5th Gen stealth. Russia's environment for data fusion isn't as deep, as connected, or as scalable as NATO's. Not because the hardware lacks ambition, but because the ecosystem lacks mass. Here's the number that explains everything. Over 1,000 F-35s are already in service or on order worldwide. NATO operators, Pacific partners, Israel, Japan, South Korea, Australia, the Lightning II is a global system, not a national one. Software updates, tactics, parts, the entire fleet learns together. Every flight fought by one F-35 teaches the next thousand. Meanwhile, the Su-57 fleet remains measured in dozens, not hundreds. Russia expects 76 aircraft by 2028 to 2029, but sanctions, supply chains and industrial strain mean slow ramp-up. As of now, Russia is the only confirmed operator. Export claims exist, but not deliveries. And that leads us to the battlefield. In Ukraine, Su-57s almost never enter hostile airspace. They launch standoff missiles from Russia. Long-range shots, no merges, no dogfights. It's the safest use case, but it also means no real testing against Western stealth or electronic warfare. It fights like a sniper, except from beyond the hill, taking shots from safety. Meanwhile, F-35s have flown real strike missions in Syria, Iraq, the Middle East, Europe and the Pacific. Israel uses them aggressively. The UK has flown sorties. The US integrates them into SEAD and DEAD doctrine like they were built to kill SAM sites in their sleep. So ask yourself, which jet is more dangerous in the fight we expect to matter? Because modern war isn't about who turns tighter in a dogfight, it's about who sees first, who connects faster, who kills without being seen. And in that world, the F-35 is not just a jet, it's an architecture of death. And yet, this isn't a story of F-35 victory and Su-57 collapse. It's a story of two visions of air power diverging. Russia built a machine that can fight in chaos. High altitude, high agility, high energy. If a merge happens, if visibility is lost, if the sky collapses into close-range knife fighting, the Su-57 becomes the threat. Its ability to point its nose where physics says it shouldn't, to bleed energy and still survive, makes it a monster no pilot would dismiss. But the F-35 was designed to make sure the merge never happens. 
If the Su-57 sees it, the F-35 wants to be gone already, or firing back from angles impossible to predict. It fights like a chess player, not a wrestler. One wins the visual fight, the other wins the invisible one. And then there's cost, the shadow that hangs over both. The F-35 is the most expensive weapons program in human history. Development alone exceeds $40 billion. Lifetime sustainment pushes past $1.5 trillion. But it's also the most industrially scaled fighter ever fielded. Over 110 jets delivered each year. Training infrastructure across continents. Software blocks rolling like iOS updates. Expensive, yes, but repeatable, maintainable, and everywhere. The Su-57? Reports place cost per jet around 35 to 50 million dollars, but that's fantasy until mass production exists. Prices include R&D, and volumes are too small to stabilize cost curves. Sanctions squeeze microelectronics, radar components, composite materials. It's a jet that could have been mass-produced in another decade, with another economy, in another world. Instead, it remains premium hardware on a budget reality. But here's where things get really interesting. The Su-57 might not need to beat the F-35 to matter. It only needs to exist in pockets, in squadrons, in enough numbers to threaten tankers, AWACS, ISR nodes. One felon popping up behind a formation could force NATO to fight differently. Even a handful of stealthy Russian air superiority jets could complicate air dominance in a region where Russia needs delay, not victory. So let's answer the question everyone came for. Which one would win? If an Su-57 drags an F-35 into a turning fight, if stealth advantage is lost, if missiles are evaded, if both fighters merge into visual range, the felon has the agility, the thrust vectoring, the aerodynamic brutality to dominate the knife fight. But the F-35 never intends to let that happen. In the real war, not the airshow war, the first shot wins. Not the best twirl, not the flashiest cobra maneuver. The jet that fires unseen, kills unseen, and vanishes into silence is the deadlier weapon. And right now, that weapon is the F-35. But war evolves. Engines evolve. Software evolves. Su-57M upgrades are coming. Block 4 F-35s are coming. J-20 is maturing. KF-21 is rising. Turkey's Khan is entering flight testing. The fifth generation battlefield is still writing itself. And the question that will decide everything is not which jet pulls harder, but which force learns faster. Agility wins dogfights. Data wins wars. If the F-35 and the Su-57 stand as the two clearest expressions of opposing stealth philosophies, the rest of the world is racing to join them. But each nation comes with its own constraints, ambitions, and reasons for entering the fifth generation club. For the first time in history, air power is no longer defined by who can build a fast jet with big wings and a loud engine. It's about who can build an aircraft that can't be seen, can't be jammed, and can't be outrun in the digital space. Stealth isn't just aerodynamics anymore. It's software, networking, materials science, and industrial stamina. And that makes the global field far more interesting than a simple East versus West divide. China's J-20 Mighty Dragon is the most mature, non-American, fifth-gen fighter in service today, flying operationally in growing numbers with the People's Liberation Army Air Force. Designed as a long-range interceptor with large internal fuel volume and high-altitude presence, the J-20's mission sits somewhere between an F-22 and a future F-15EX replacement. 
a jet built to push deep into contested airspace, chase down high-value assets, and escort China's strategic bombers. With production accelerating and new WS-15 engines entering testing, the J-20 isn't just a technology demonstrator. It's the centerpiece of China's long-term air denial strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Then there's its smaller, more export-friendly sibling, the FC-35 J-35. Initially a private venture, now adapted for China's navy, it represents Beijing's move into carrier-based stealth aviation. Twin engines, compact frame, shaping reminiscent of the F-35, the J-35 will eventually operate from China's new Katobar carriers, transforming regional power projection. Unlike the J-20, the J-35 is built with foreign buyers in mind, making it one of the few potential stealth jets available globally outside U.S. export channels. Moving south, South Korea's KF-21 Borame sits at an interesting threshold. It flies, it trains, it integrates, but it isn't fully fifth gen yet. Block 1 and 2 operate as advanced 4.5 gen airframes, but Block 3, expected later this decade, will add internal weapons bays, stealth coatings, and deeper avionics integration, effectively pushing it into 5th gen class. Korea's approach is evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Get it flying, get it reliable, then refine it. This strategy mirrors how Seoul built missile, radar, and naval programs by iteration, not leaps. Turkey's Khan follows a similar ambition-driven path. Intended as Ankara's first stealth air dominance fighter, Khan is still in early flight testing, but carries Turkey's desire for aerospace independence. Indigenous sensors, AI-assisted avionics, optional unmanned modes. Khan is built not just to fly, but to challenge dependency on foreign powerhouses. If engine development stabilizes and production scales, it could become the most accessible fifth-gen platform for the Middle East and Eurasia. Taken together, these programs show a world in transition. Fifth-gen fighters are no longer a luxury for superpowers. They are the new price of entry into great power competition. Every jet is a flag, every prototype a statement, and every rollout a warning. The next air war won't be fought by two nations. It will be fought by everyone who refuses to be left behind. And that brings us to the end of our look into the world of fifth-generation fighters. Machines built not just to fly, but to decide the sky itself. From the F-35's invisible kill web to the Su-57's supermaneuverable ambition, from China's rapidly expanding J-20 fleet to the next-gen challenges rising in Korea, the future of air combat isn't one aircraft or even one country. It's a race of ideas, doctrine and data unfolding at just below the speed of sound. But now it's your turn. If you've seen these jets up close, or better, flown in one, tell us your experience in the comments. Which fighter do you believe defines the future? Stealth and networking, or agility and raw power? If you enjoyed this deep dive into modern air power, hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you never miss an upload. Thanks for watching, stay sharp, stay curious, and we'll see you in the next one.